Welcome everybody to HRPC. It's one, so we're going to get started. We always, always run out of time in this research group because we have great talks, uh, great discussion of drafts, and I think uh, we ought to get going. So great, I see, um, I think I see our first speaker online. Hey, Steven, thanks for joining. Do you wanna do an audio check or anything? Sure, can you hear me? Yeah, good. We will, um, we do a little welcome in the beginning. So this is the agenda folks. We've got a welcome. Um, we'll have uh, three talks each 30 minutes. I think all of our presenters are here. Um, yep. And then uh, we have at the end, we'll hopefully have about 25 minutes to get through um, current work and current discussions. Um, so yeah, I guess I will, I think, Sophia, you're, you're driving the slides. Thank you so much. So the, the first things are the reminders. Um, the blue sheets are those, well, they're clipboards with a sheet of blue paper on them. They're up here, I believe. Can you pass them going back? Um, for folks, you need to scan in if you're in person so that your um, participation here is registered. Thanks. Or you can um, go outside the room and the QR codes are available. If you're in the Meet Echo, you are automatically signed in. Um, the next thing is to note, this is recorded. It'll be posted on YouTube later. You might wanna just take note of that. Um, also, can I ask for a volunteer note taker? We really, because it's a presentation heavy um, session, You'll only need to scribe discussion that happens after the presentation, since those presentations are available online, um, slides, I mean, and then any discussion on the drafts. Could somebody volunteer to note? Thank you. Thanks. It's always good to have a double team, so really, really appreciate that. Um, and then the last thing is for the Q&A, uh, if you can please use the Meet Echo app to get in the queue. Um, that'll make things more efficient. Next slide. So this is the note well. Every group, every session you attend is going to have the same text, although in the IRTF it also applies. Um, if you know of any intellectual property rights, you need to disclose those uh, during this discussion, even if they're not yours. Next slide. Yep. Did we skip one? Yeah. This one's important, privacy and code of conduct. Um, this applies all the time um, in IETF meetings, but also on the list. So please note that in terms of behavior and comportment, anti-harassment policies are included. And next slide. I think there's something about audio visual, but that's, that's good. Um, so yeah, the Internet Research Task Force, we're looking at longer term issues um, we're not an IETF working group. Um, our issues are related to human rights. We'll get to this charter in a second. Um, and so, yeah, we're actively looking for open research questions. Uh, we're not developing standards. Um, a lot of what we do is actually presentation of research that is potentially published elsewhere that folks in the um, community may benefit from knowing about. Uh, but we also welcome active work and research to be happening in our group. And that's what those drafts are at the end of our agenda. We'll get to talk about those. Uh, next slide. So um, this is a little premature, but I didn't change the slide from the last couple of meetings. We are not yet chartered to have the and policy part in our um, name, um, but we are the Human Rights Considerations Research Group. And so we're interested in the overall question of how um, internet protocols strengthen or threaten, stricken and threaten often human rights. Um, you can read more about our past work at um, hrpc.io. Uh, next slide, please. So in our current charter, our objectives are pretty basic. We're trying to um, highlight these connections um, there's some overlap here. It goes both ways. Protocols have impacts on human rights. Human rights considerations um, might um, impact the way protocols are designed. 
Um, to that end then, not just drawing connections, but we're actually actively trying to develop practical, useful guidance on how um, these issues might be mitigated or aligned, amplified, that sort of thing, depending on um, what is the issue at hand. So it's a broad field, at least from my perspective, as a person who works on human rights for a long time, and these um, conclusions are not, um, these are not obvious already. So we're, we're actively uncovering them. And then the last thing is we're just really raising, raising awareness in both. And to note that um, this goes both ways in terms of the issues, human rights on the internet, internet on human rights, but also in the community and external to the community. So folks are often coming to present that are from outside the immediate technical community that talk about human rights or other things that are of consequence to this community. And also the converse is true where uh, folks who are participating actively in not just HRPC, but also in the IETF community at large spend their time outside and are talking about some of these issues. And so it's great to be able to get that uh, cross-pollination and it's something that we are explicitly doing as part of this uh, research group. Um, next slide. Um, so I wanna thank the folks that help make this research group run. So we have two technical advisors, we have DKG and we have Melinda Shore. Um, we also have one doc shepherd at the moment, um, Nick Doty on draft association. So um, Sophia and I are the co-chairs and then Colin Perkins is the chair of the IRTF and is doing a lot of work to help think, uh, get things moving and make things work here. Um, so we have just two active drafts at the moment. Um, they're both in quite a late stage because they're quite old, um, but those are their only active drafts. Um, the one is on uh, draft guidelines, draft association is the other. Um, we'll talk about those a little bit later. And then we do have another draft that we've been talking about, but is not officially a research group document at the moment. And that's the draft on intimate partner violence, digital considerations. Um, we have some expired drafts, but we don't, we don't talk about expired drafts. That's, I think, the last of the welcome slides. Is there anything else in there? Cool. So we're going to move on. Um, I went a little bit over, sorry. I like to be very thorough because I know folks watch this on YouTube. I know almost always we have speakers that come in that have never been to an IETF meeting before, let alone an HRPC session. So I go a little slow in the end to sort of set that context and um, set us up for maybe welcoming new work, of course. Um, so anyway, I'm gonna hand over now to our first speaker. Stephen, I'm gonna have you introduce yourself um, and your talk. And uh, Sophia, I believe is gonna either be able to drive the slides for you or she can pass you the controls, however you uh, prefer to do that. I will pass you to control to you, Stephen. Um, give me a second. <laughs> but you can introduce yourself if you want in the meantime. <laughs> uh, sure. Yeah, um, Steve Feldstein, I'm a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment in the Democracy Program. Uh, my research focuses on the um, convergence of technology, public policy, democracy, uh, geopolitics. Uh, so I've done a variety of different types of research. What I will mostly talk about today uh, will be how to measure and think about uh, digital repression. Uh, so I, um, I'll introduce the topic in, in my presentation, but essentially I wrote a book that was published in 2021 uh, called The Rise of Digital Repression, which talks specifically about how um, different leaders around the world, autocrats as well as democratic leaders, are using digital technologies to advance their political objectives. Uh, and in doing the research, I combined uh, qualitative and quantitative methods uh, to better measure and understand what those trends look like. So that essentially will be what I will talk about uh, momentarily. So it looks like the slide is up. Um, and it looks like, let me just see if I can move it. All right, great, perfect. Yeah, right, good. Um, and then one more, one thing to check in with you, Mallory, is that my plan is to talk for 20 minutes and to leave about 10 minutes for Q&A. Is that how you like it? Or do you want me to wait? Or do you want me to talk all the way through the 30? I assume just 20 and then 10. Exactly, yeah, thanks. Okay. Great. Well, my the time the the clock is ticking, so I'll start uh, right now. Okay. So um, really happy to be here again. Thanks. Thank you, Mallory, for organizing this and for inviting me to participate. I apologize for not being able to do this in person, uh, but hopefully in future uh, conferences I will be able to see you all. Um, but for now, uh, we'll go with the virtual. Uh, so to set the context for um, digital oppression and kind of the trajectory, um, we'll go to the next slide right here. 
Uh, and, and essentially, the, the, the big idea is that we've seen a shift uh, happen when it comes to the use of information and communication technologies uh, in the political and public arena. Uh, and so right here, you can see uh, the kind of optimism of the early 2010s and even prior to that with regard to the color revolutions and with regard to Arab Spring protests, where uh, it was viewed that uh, social media and other communications uh, uh, forms digital communication forms were really responsible for helping to mobilize publics, uh, to galvanize people onto the streets and to push back against entrenched autocratic systems. And so there was a lot of optimism about the ability of social media, of different information technologies to really uh, mass and change the nature of citizen resistance uh, to authoritarian forms of government. Uh, and in fact, there was such an optimism that we, um, the community coined the term liberation technology to celebrate the fact that um, you know, these, these technologies were really helping to power and enable a, a new form of protest, a new means uh, of challenging uh, autocratic rule. Uh, and so fast forward here, uh, only uh, eight years later, um, we've seen a pretty significant shift. Uh, this represents facial recognition surveillance uh, in China via one of its safe cities. Um, and you can see that uh, a lot of the kind of optimism uh, has sort of moved into a much more pessimistic state that uh, in part, this is a reflection uh, of governments learning from uh, and, and kind of thinking about new strategies and new techniques to counteract uh, these unprecedented digital movements uh, and to find ways in which to harness, manipulate and exploit these technologies uh, for surveillance uh, and other coercive purposes. And while China certainly does not represent uh, the median in terms of either autocratic regimes or um, governments worldwide in terms of what they are doing with technology. Uh, as I'll discuss a little later in this presentation, China does represent a model that other uh, countries have emulated uh, as uh, to sort of showcase what is potentially possible when it comes to using digital tools as a means to reassert political control um, uh, in, in sort of more recent, more recent years. Uh, so let's start with just some basics uh, right here. Um, you know what I want to um, what I want to want to emphasize is that um, my argument is is essentially that as citizens have increasingly gone online uh, for all aspects of their life, whether it's political participation, whether it's communicating with um, uh, with friends and peers, whether it's engaging in e-commerce, leaders have sought to harness and control those communications, and we're sort of in the midst of a struggle right now. One that uh, you could argue is uh, is in uh, that governments have the upper hand uh, in in more recent years. Uh, so, what is digital repression? I define it in the book, and this is the book that I wrote about the digital repression. I define digital repression as a use of digital uh, information and communication technologies to surveil, coerce, and manipulate individuals or groups in order to deter specific activities or beliefs that challenge the state. Uh, so, this is mostly centered around uh, state. Uh, activities or or groups that are affiliated with or sponsored with or have some nexus uh, uh, or connection uh, to state actors. Uh, so it, re it really is focused on that sort of political idea. And so to kind of take it one step further and say, okay, so this, this is a broad definition. What exactly are we talking about when it comes to technologies and techniques? Uh, this taxonomy right here, visual repression, which um, I developed for the book, uh, tries to break it down into more specific areas. Uh, so first is surveillance, uh, and this can be both mass surveillance techniques using biometric um, uh, indicators uh, or other types of public surveillance cameras. It can also be much more targeted. So it can re refer to spyware, uh, you know, use of malware to uh, target uh, particular individuals uh, who represent challenges to the state in terms of accessing their personal communications, their personal data, uh, and so forth in compromising ways or ways that would exploit um, uh, their, their information. It can also refer to laws and directives that are implemented by, uh, by governments as a way to authorize uh, governments to access uh, information. Uh, next is censorship. Uh, and, you know, again, censorship can take lots of forms. It can be, uh, you know, in popular imagination, China's Great Firewall is a good example of putting up, uh, you know, a, a large barrier uh, uh, in, in which to prevent Chinese citizens from accessing outside information. Uh, but censorship I, in, in more recent uh, iterations can be much more nuanced. It can involve uh, excessive 
content takedown requests for social media platforms that ends up um, um, and they are ends up uh, motivating incentivizing platforms to take down more content than they otherwise would. Uh, it can result in filtering of specific websites or platform blocking of certain uh, platforms, but not others. And Russia is a good case in point of that. Uh, so there's a all, sort of large varieties uh, of how this is implemented. But the bottom line idea is that this is meant to allow for greater control of governments when it comes to information flowing to citizens and, and information flowing from citizens out uh, into the public. Uh, third is uh, social manipulation and uh, disinformation. Uh, and so this relates to the, the idea, particularly of government-sponsored strategies uh, intended to manipulate uh, and, and change around the information consumed by citizens, particularly around particular political events or elections. So a good example of this that I used in a chapter in my book relates to the activities of former president of the Philippines, Rodrigo Duterte, who built up a disinformation uh, networked architecture uh, that involved hiring all sorts of different levels of individuals, uh, largely uh, linked to public relations firms as a way to manipulate popular opinion, as well as to sow doubt and cynicism in society and to harass and intimidate government critics and opposition members. Uh, and so this in particular relates very strongly to Maria Ressa, a past Nobel laureate, uh, who uh, is the founder of an independent media outlet, Rappler, that has attempted to hold to account Duterte and now the Marcos government when it comes to their policies, but who instead has, has felt the brunt of Duterte's disinformation campaign when it comes to excessive means of harassment, as well as um, sort of linked to cyber libel and other uh, physical persecution strategies. Uh, so one thing that's, I think, important to mention is that these are not um, segregated categories. They very much feed into and relate to one another. And so uh, when, you, when you think about Maria Ressa in the disinformation campaign, that also links up to the top category, persecution against online users, in a sense that she was persecuted, particularly because she has an online following and because so much of the Philippines is online and on Facebook. And because Rappler was, has become so adept and being able to get messages out there, uh, because of that presence, she has been particularly targeted as a, uh, as a, a person of, of political interest. Uh, and then finally, uh, there's internet shutdowns, which uh, in many respects is very closely linked to and a form uh, of, of censorship. But I think what is important and distinct about internet shutdowns is the fact that they are time bound. Uh, oftentimes they're also bound by geography. Uh, uh, and, and so, you know, they can uh, entail regional shutdowns in particular areas. A good example of that uh, uh, occurred in Kashmir in India and in Tigray in Ethiopia uh, for uh, well over a year, uh, close to two years, uh, where uh, in those regions due to uh, unrest slash uh, civil, uh, civil war, uh, the internet was systematically denied and cut off for those citizens. And so when you think about internet shutdowns as a deliberate act, as a time act, as one that oftentimes is, is uh, limited uh, by geography, uh, that's how I sort of think about uh, you know, the sort of nature of this, this tool uh, as one, one that's used. So uh, having thought a little bit, having walked through what, you know, the definitions of digital repression and a taxonomy uh, of it, I think what's, what's interesting next is to think about what do the trends look like globally? So one of the things I think is interesting here is that we know that around the world, uh, since around 2004, uh, democracy uh, has witnessed backsliding around the world. And so one of the things I did is I aggregated kind of what that looks like. And you can see some slippage uh, over here. What is interesting is I've also, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, I've also um, captured data um, from the Digital Society Project that measures levels of digital repression, uh, both in the aggregate and disaggregated by country. Uh, and um, I put that into the same graph on a year by year basis. And what you can see is that well, democracy has either stagnated or backslid uh, over the past 20 years, the levels of digital repression implemented by governments around the world, whether authoritarian or democratic, has increased uh, significantly in that same period. Uh, and so I think that just shows that as we've entered the digital age, um, as, we've, uh, as, as governments have recognized the importance of trying to control uh, digital uh, communications, they have also invested in new capabilities and new policies 
uh, to control, harness, coerce, and manipulate those very same communications. And this helps to put a uh, finer point uh, on that, uh, that issue. So over here, um, uh, and just, so, just to kind of take a step back, what I did in the book and what I've kind of updated on a year, year, uh, yearly basis is put together uh, uh, what I call a digital repression index. And so the, uh, there is an outfit called the Digital Society Project that is linked to the Varieties of Democracy Project, which mo most people consider uh, perhaps alongside Freedom House to be one of the uh, sort of most rigorous uh, statistical um, uh, data sets uh, available when it comes to measuring different aspects of democracy. Uh, the Varieties of Democracy Project uh, and its adjunct Digital Society Project uses survey data of experts uh, on a, uh, that varies by country in order to, to uh, essentially measure via their answers and perceptions different levels um, of, uh, of digital repression. And so in that, uh, uh, in that data, they have variables that measure uh, social media surveillance, uh, internet censorship by country, uh, government and political party disinformation, uh, internet shutdowns by country, uh, as well as arrests of online users. And so what I did is I took all the individual uh, variable data that was there, aggregated it uh, into a single composite indicator, and then measured it on a year by year, by year basis and looked at uh, and then looked at that distribution uh, in different ways. And so what we can see here uh, is that, you know, unsurprisingly, so the countries in red have the highest levels of digital oppression around the world. This is for last year. Uh, those in blue have the least, uh, the, the lowest amounts. Uh, and one of the uh, regressions uh, that I ran measured uh, levels of democracy um, in uh, and its relationship uh, to levels of digital repression. Unsurprisingly, there's a very robust relationship between the two. Uh, in that, in in other words, um, um, the, uh, a country's level of democracy is a strong predictor of whether it'll actually have high levels of digital repression. So you can see that among the worst performers in the world. Uh, include uh, countries like China, North Korea, Saudi Arabia, uh, Venezuela, uh, and so forth, countries that uh, also have huge uh, levels of uh, political repression, repression, traditional uh, repression, violence against civil society, uh, restrictions on freedom of expression, uh, and so forth. So there's a very strong linkage between the two, between the digital techniques on the one hand and uh, low levels of democracy on the other hand. Uh, in fact, if you sort of just break it down, um, just to kind of give you a shortcut, uh, in terms of looking at which countries rank worst and best, you can see that for 2022, the most repressive include North Korea, Turkmenistan, Eritrea, South Sudan, Iran, and China. And likewise, your classic Nordic, Northern European countries, uh, with the exception of, of Portugal, uh, uh, stack up uh, as the least digitally repressive uh, around the world. And then if you, I also broke it down uh, by region. And so you can see that among the worst uh, regions when it comes to levels of digital repression, uh, includes South and Central Asia, uh, as well as the Middle East and, and North Africa. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is mixed. There's some countries that are, perform pretty poorly, uh, but there are other places that do much better as well. And then when it comes to those who are best performing, uh, countries in the Western Hemisphere, both Latin America, Central America, and, and you know, and uh, in North America, uh, as well as Europe and, uh, and Eurasia, uh, uh, showcase uh, the least amount uh, of, of digital uh, repression. And then over here, what I wanted to show, what I wanted to model a relationship uh, between uh, what I mentioned, uh, digital repression on the one hand and electoral democracy over uh, a 10 year period. Uh, so I, I ran a, a linear regression uh, using uh, the variety of democracies projects, uh, electoral democracy index as the explanatory variable and the digital repression index, uh, which I had established as an outcome variable, variable uh, and essentially what we found is this show, uh, the scatter plot here shows a very close alignment between the two variables. Essentially 76% of the variability of the digital repression index is explained by the democracy index uh, uh, that I mentioned. So one of the other questions I wanted to ask was that if you were to break down different factors uh, that um, make up aspects that contribute to a democracy, um, which one of those was much so strongly linked to digital repression, which one of those is the best predictor for whether you'll have digital repression? So in other words, um, if you deprive private civil liberties, is, is that linked to digital, uh, uh, digital repression? If you have a state that commits an excessive amount of, of violence, does that uh, link to digital repression? 
What about deprivation of political civil liberties? Or what about civil society repression? So uh, what I did um, over here uh, is essentially I put together a, uh, put together a model that incorporated these four uh, variables, which are individual variables measured by the Varieties of Democracy Project. Uh, I then I then measured against each one and held constant the others. Uh, and what I found was by far the strongest relationship to digital oppression was countries that deprived political civil liberties. So in other words, if a country is, is systematically reducing uh, freedom of speech, uh, if they are stopping people from gathering in the streets uh, for, for peaceful assembly, uh, if they are restricting the ability of media or of political parties uh, from uh, you know, uh, uh, from competing fairly uh, in elections, then chances are they're also accompanying those those actions with digital oppression actions as well. And so I think that is an important insight from my perspective because it really tries to hone in on what is the core aspect motivating factor for digital oppression. And at least according to the data that I've gathered, uh, it's, it's political. Uh, and so where does that then lead us? Well, um, I spent um, a good portion of the book then trying to think about, uh, trying to then understand and analyze and using case studies and field research to better hone in and, and, and interrogate this idea of the political. And so here are some kind of basic findings that I want to leave with you before we go uh, into Q&A. Q so on the basis of, of, uh, of the research, uh, authoritarian governments are certainly more likely to rely on digital oppression techniques than democratic governments. But while all authoritarian governments repre digitally repress, they do so in distinct ways. Uh, so it really varies from the simple to the sophisticated. Uh, some countries like China uh, implement vast blocks uh, and really kind of focus on control techniques. Other countries, um, perhaps with lower capacity, uh, like Ethiopia, like Uganda, uh, like Turkey, uh, to some extent, will rely on uh, platform blocks or select internet shutdowns in which to accomplish their objectives, but have less of a systematic uh, social control aspect uh, along the lines of what one would find in China and increasingly in Iran and uh, Russia. Democracy is as also repressed as well, so they're not exempt. And particularly if you go one level below liberal democracies and look at uh, hybrid regimes and weaker democracies, places like uh, the Philippines, like India, like Kenya, Hungary, or Brazil, uh, you'll find a variety, a variety of techniques that are used, but one of the, uh, but one of the kind of more emphasized techniques in democracies over our, uh, autocracies is the use of manipulation techniques versus control. So the use of disinformation uh, and and manipulation of public opinion, uh, as opposed to uh, uh, controlled uh, techniques like blanket censorship or mass uh, surveillance. And I think in part that relates to the political norms and traditions that uh, operate under semi-democracies or partial democracies or weak democracies versus authoritarian uh, states. Now, one other aspect I want to quickly touch upon before I conclude is the question of China. China uh, is, a, is a, a question and an issue that comes up in terms of its relative influence uh, in terms of spreading out digital oppression around the world. And I think there are some aspects to that that, are, that, that make sense and there are some other aspects that have been exaggerated. So I do think that China's diffusion of digital technology is shaping data governance and leading to negative policy outcomes. Sometimes those actions directly reinforce digital oppression. Sometimes uh, those don't. In terms of their most relevant outcomes is one, parallel modeling. So uh, China providing a model for how a state can deploy these techniques to control information. Two, supplying digital infrastructure and platforms. So everything from ICT networks to 5G capabilities that incorporate censorship and um, surveillance facets. And three, uh, uh, China attempting to exert uh, greater influence on multilateral standard setting bodies uh, by placing citizens in key leadership posts. Although there is some dispute about whether, uh, about how effective that has been. And then finally, Beijing also exploiting Chinese platforms to advance censorship and surveillance interests, such as some of the techniques you would find over WeChat. However, where I think the digital authoritarianism model falls short when it comes to China uh, is that one, Chinese companies aren't the only ones supplying repressive digital tools to autocrats. They face stiff competition from firms based in democracies, uh, from, uh, from OECD countries in Europe, uh, United States, as well as Israel. Uh, second, that when you think about how digital repression spreads, 
by looking at China, it's really focusing on supply side dynamics when in fact, I would argue that internal political motivations, domestic considerations are just as important and probably much more important as uh, animating factors for why a regime would choose to acquire techniques and then deploy them as opposed to simply being told by uh, Chinese authority that this is a good idea and here are subsidized technologies that you can use. Uh, and then finally, I, I do think that China's motivations for selling these technologies is as much uh, to benefit its, uh, its economic interests as it is to um, advance a, an overall grand political agenda uh, when it comes to propagating authoritarianism around the world. And so thinking about how that actually lines up empirically, uh, I think is also important. So in conclusion, uh, I think to come up with practical and effective solutions to counter digital repression, it's important for policymakers uh, and experts to have grounded and accurate understandings about what is driving digital repression on a country basis. Uh, it's not just a China problem. It's more complicated than democracies versus autocracies. Instead, look to regime incentives and demand signals to understand motivations for acquiring these techniques. Thanks. Uh, let me stop there and turn it over to Mallory for Q&A. Yeah, reminder to use the Me Echo tool to please get in the queue. While folks are doing that, um, I did have a question for you, Stephen. Um, it was on your penultimate slide, number 11, when you're really helpfully um, just aggregating the different factors that sort of lead to, um, or actually that, that, that's the reverse that I'm asking. Like you're, you're talking about the different things that um, indicate strong correlation with digital repression. But I also wonder if the reverse is true, if, um, you know, you take digital repression, or in this case, the strong one was political civil liberties, does that also indicate maybe more uh, tendency to exert power that is more damaging? For example, like physical violence was another one, right? Like kind of taking the theory on its head. Does the ability to control information indicate an interest or a capacity to exact state violence? Yeah, no, it's an interesting question. And I think people kind of look upon it in two ways. So one is that they are mutually reinforcing, that one is naturally a complement to another. Uh, but a lot, of actually, uh, a lot of people actually think, uh, a lot of research shows that there can be a bit of a substitution effect. Uh, so the idea would be that um, rather that you can, you, you need to find a way, a regime needs to find a way to exert control. Uh, and that um, you know, violence is certainly one option, but it comes with a lot of attendant problems. So there's a, a, a principal agent problem where you're not sure, uh, and we saw this recently with Prigozhin in Russia, you're not sure that the people you are giving orders to to commit violence will actually follow through and carry them out. Uh, there's other problems associated with it as well in terms of, uh, you know, being beholden to security services uh, as a key to your power, as opposed to having, being able to kind of diffuse that out. And so a lot of countries actually see benefits, and not to mention the public backlash problem, and that coercion and violence is oftentimes very unpopular, even if it's suppressed. And so uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of autocrats see benefits uh, to turning to digital repression means as an alternative. So in Turkey, for you know, rigging elections, rather than basically putting guns uh, out in the streets and telling people, you better go for Erdogan, uh, you know, instead you block access to information. Uh, you restrict what people are able to, to, to see. And then what they are able to see is largely dominated uh, by digital uh, communications linked to state-sponsored outlets. And therefore, you ach accomplish a similar outcome, but without all the hassle of having to actually commit violence uh, and, and so forth. So I, think, I do think there is something to the substitution effect as well. Victoria? Hi, Victor, <coughs> Victor Bertola as an individual. Um, so I, I found uh, there's something I find interesting. So you, you made plenty of examples during your presentation of digital repression, and they were all from non-Western countries. But what I find interesting is, is that if I take your definition of digital repression and I show it to any of the stupid anti-vaxxers, uh, climate change deniers uh, on Facebook from my own country in Europe, I mean, they would swear that they, this is what is happening to them. And I mean, they're... they're their content is being taken down by the platforms so and pressured by the authorities because they are denying what the state want, uh, wants us to think. But even more, I mean, seriously, in a way, uh, 
you know that uh, to, to, I mean, uh, the European countries have started uh, uh, with the Ukrainian war to censor any Russian state media, so they, you're not allowed to read them in Europe uh, anymore. And uh, like one month ago at Eurodig, which is the European uh, preparatory conference for, uh, for the IGF, the UN IGF, there were actually an entire morning devoted to a panel with governments uh, from some of the countries that you listed as the, uh, the least repressive, I mean, countries from Scandinavia, Eastern Europe, the Baltics, and they all were arguing that uh, it should be impossible for people to say on social media that maybe Ukraine could also have committed like uh, war crimes or mis anything negative about uh, Mr. Zelensky. Or, and we're actually arguing for, I mean, this content be taken down and people be prosecuted if they continue saying this. So my question is, it's fine to look at, I mean, the, more, the worst things are the very you know, worst things that China is doing. But should we, shouldn't we also look at what is happening in the West? And uh, do you think that this is also digital repression or, or is this outside of your definition of digital repression, in fact? So but what's your take on what is happening in, yeah. in the West on this? Well, I mean, look, I mean, I, I'm, to be honest, um, I don't have a ton of sympathy when it comes to uh, calling it digital oppression uh, in relation to um, pushing back against Russian disinformation related to the Ukraine war. I don't. And I think it's, there's a qualitative difference between uh, repression that is used to uh, consolidate government control via censorship uh, of domestic politics uh, versus, um, you know, some of the fights that we've seen in relation to COVID misinformation or climate change denialism uh, and so forth. I mean, ultimately, you know, my, the, the indicators that I use are borrowed from widely accepted indicators of democratic uh, resilience and strength uh, that are uh, put out by, um, you know, credible institutions like Freedom House, like the Varieties of Democracy Project and so forth. And they have, uh, you know, uh, different, you know, a, a rigorous model that goes in to determining what qualifies as a democracy or, uh, or not. And it's not based on whether you're a Western country, it's based on whether a host of, in, uh, of things from uh, following uh, the uh, principles of the ICCPR, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, upholding the rule of law, having a means of accountability for citizens are upheld. So, I mean, really what I would say is that in some ways I'm an intermediary. I look at the data as it's uh, defined and collected by um, you know, the, these different uh, democracy research organizations, I then pair it with the data uh, as it's collected on digital oppression, and I tell you what the, what the results are. Uh, but I think that they're pretty robust. Miria? Yeah, hi, Mia Kulvin. Thank you for the talk. Very interesting. So when, when I see the things, I always start thinking about the technology behind it, like how is it actually done, right? And how can we... Um, circumvent that or whatever. Um, but what I noticed is that um, what we see probably yes is that complete internet shutdowns because everybody has noticed there's a dependency on the internet and it has economic implications if you do that. So I think what we also see is a lot of investment in these technologies um, to control information. So I, I was just wondering, I don't know if you have an answer, if you have like any knowledge or guesses about like what's the budget that these regimes invest into a repression. Of information. Sorry, what was the last part? Do I have any what, knowledge? What's, of, what's what? the budget? What's the money that is actually oh. going into there? Do you have any insights about that? I was just curious. Um, you know, it really varies by different countries. I have some data uh, in relation to kind of Chinese investments in certain types of surveillance technologies. But I mean, the problem is that one, it can oftentimes, I mean, it's hard to kind of measure year in, year out. It obviously is something that uh, is kept fairly closely held for other reasons. I mean, what I can say is that the investments are significant, and you know, the the and if you sort of break it out by sector, uh, you can start to get more insight. So, for example, I've looked a little bit further into spyware, uh, and I have you know kind of information about different contracts that have been tendered. Uh, they run into the hundreds of, hundreds of millions of dollars. For example, there was just an FT disclosure, Financial Times disclosure that came a few months ago about a new tender from the Indian government related to a spyware contract that is out for bid that runs to about 120 to 140 million dollars. I don't know how about how many years it's for, uh, but that at least kind of gives you some rough rough uh, scope. Frankly, there's a need for more information out there, and I would. Uh, impress upon different people in the room to see if you can find that information. It ought to be disclosed, and oftentimes it's hidden. Tobias. 
Tobias Wiewich, Max Planck Institut für Informatik, speaking from. Please. Um, Tobias Hivik, Max Planck Institute for Informatics, speaking for myself and not my affiliation. So I would like to um, challenge your point and your um, limited patience for the point brought by the first um, question. So um, last year, I made the point that uh, the internet likely will fall apart based on our introduction of digital sanctions. And that is a relatively value-free perspective on that because as you said, for example, many Western companies are supplying the censorship infrastructures. And for a product manager at Juniper, I would assume it doesn't really matter whether the task is um, make wares or music download websites unaccessible or make something else, which is due to political decision, decided to be made unavailable, unavailable. And if we are looking at what we did with the internet sanctions is we enabled policymakers to know like, you can do that, we can do that. We can make certain things unreachable. And what should be unreachable will differ between different countries. In Germany, for example, you will want to make gambling websites unavailable. In Texas, it might be something else. So how can we, in that situation, really distinguish between the rule of law governing what is censorship and what is not? Because Making access to healthcare in Texas unavailable is certainly lawful in Texas. It's just unethical. Yeah, look, I mean, without getting into a, a huge debate about it, I'm certainly not going to defend, uh, you know, some of the, develop, the political developments in Texas. But I, what I will say is this, that in a democratic system uh, or in a context like Texas, I mean, th there is uh, an accountable electoral system where you can vote out representatives who are putting forth policies that are illiberal or that run contrary uh, to to the public interest of society. Um, and, you know, that system uh, has a lot of flaws. It doesn't work very well. It can be slow. Uh, but ultimately, there is a, a, a number of different accountability mechanisms, both the kind of accountability through courts uh, and through the executive to check some of those measures, as well as accountability through voters. If you compare that to authoritarian systems, there is no accountability for that. It is ruled by a single, by a clique, by a regime, or by an individual. And so that, to me, is the fundamental difference. Even in, in, in a weak democracy, there is some ability to vote out uh, uh, you know, a, a leader who is putting forth bad policies, but it's hard because elections are rigged. In an authoritarian country, uh, there is no option to do that. And so you know, democracies aren't perfect systems for accountability. There are lots of problems when it comes to bad policies that uh, are illiberal in nature, but you do have checks and balances within a rule of law framework that allow for um, for remediation. That would be my answer. Thanks. And we have very limited time. So the last two um, questions, please, can we keep them very short? All right. Thank you very much. This was a great talk. Uh, Dan Harkins, uh, I'm wondering if you've looked into uh, uh, digital dig, uh, social credit systems and what their impact is on digital repression. So for instance, China has a very sophisticated one where people actually get a score that can deny them travel access and things like that. But we've seen less uh, sophisticated ones in say Canada or the United States where people are denied access to certain civil services uh, such as you know setting up a GoFundMe or, or having a bank account that, that really prevents them from, from participating in, in society mm -hmm. because of their, their, their beliefs that may run contrary to the, the beliefs of the state. Yeah, I have looked a little bit into social credit. Uh, I mean, certainly in the China context, I mean, one of the things I will say there is that there's been a little more exaggeration than reality in terms of how they're implemented. So while there is maybe a future intent to consolidate all sorts of different information streams into assign a single number that would kind of uh, determine whether a citizen would be able to access services or not, or whether they're in the good graces of the CCP or not. Uh, in reality, uh, this system remains uh, riven by inefficiencies, uh, by siloed uh, information streams, and by bureaucracy. And so it still has yet to uh, reach a, a level where the goal of a single number following around an individual uh, and determining whether they can access services or not is actually a reality. Uh, so it's been, it's much more fractured in practice. But, you know, that being said, just as you see uh, in, in Western countries as well, uh, there are ways in which 
you know, financial um, problems can follow around, can prevent uh, one from obtaining certain services. And the more that these, uh, this information is fused, the more that systems are, are um, become interoperable, I think the more this will become a problem. So I do think that this is a, a trend that is concerning and worth watching, both in the Chinese context, but also uh, in the context for, uh, for liberal democracies as well. Nick? Yeah, thanks. I really appreciate the taxonomy at the beginning of the different ways that digital repression is engaged and, uh, and your points about how different countries might choose them in different ways. I also wonder if you have evidence of a shift in the trend, like a, from my very non-professional perspective, it seems like, oh, that seems like there's more work on misinformation and disinformation and manipulation. Is it true that that is on, on the rise or is that... Uh, just some countries are picking that up, whereas these things are ever present. Yeah, it's a little bit of a, it's a good question. I mean, it's a little bit of a tough one to, to kind of address for the fact that, I mean, what we know is that use of the internet connectivity and subsequent use of, of social media continues to rise every year. So in other words, more citizens and more countries are, um, you know, connecting to Facebook, getting accounts, uh, you know, on Telegram and, and WhatsApp and so forth and, and engaging. And so one question you could ask is whether efforts to control that are more or less constant and are rising just because there are more people that are on or whether you actually are seeing greater levels of, of um, government engagement uh, in addition to more users who are coming online and taking advantage of these services. I mean, my, my guess, and, and there isn't really... Um, hard data out there. This is one of the problems in this field is that um, it's hard to actually quantify in specific ways year year by year in, year out, uh, actual levels uh, in terms of how they're increasing. So we can kind of aggregate, we can make uh, estimations, uh, but it's hard to actually pin it down to specific numbers. Uh, but but just based on um, different case studies that I've looked at uh, and, and different uh, uh, other examples, it does appear to be a continuing and growing trend. Uh, so that would I mean, that's sort of an unsatisfactory answer, but that's sort of the best I can give you in, in a minute here. Thanks very much, Stephen. I know you fit a lot of content into this talk. Um, and we want to thank you for coming. So <laughs> thanks so much. Um, so John, I'll invite you up. We're going to hope for the best with the slides and the clicker. Yeah, uh, actually, you'll stand here. I'll stand there. Yes, Ooh, on, the, on, the, on the pink X. Um, and Sophia, if you could pull up John's slides, and then he's got a clicker. We're going to yeah, see if that works. Okay, yes. awesome. I think... You know, there's, there's an apple up here, and somebody's going to die by that apple before the third talk is over. Chekhov's Law. Um, so are my slides like, up? Um, a new deck is being... I don't think you can use the clicker, yeah. though, because um, you need to be in the mid deck call for me to pass you to the slides. But I can pass What's, them for you. He's got he's got an actual physical clicker that's been on the desk. They they brought Oh, but I think I'm it doesn't work if he's not in the Miteco thingy. <laughs> Does it work right now? Let's okay, try. I'm not going to be in Miteco in the next two minutes. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Can I push space? On the I think the keyboard is disabled. Awesome. Yeah. I I mean I okay. assume the can clicker exists for a reason. For <laughs> you just. Let's try. Oh, good idea. Thank oh, you, Lars. There's done. an engineer in the room. It does not work. Okay. Yeah. Um, we'll just yeah. have to ask Sophia to progress this. Yes. Okay. Okay. Just let me know oh. and I will pass it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you for your patience. So, hi, I'm John Heideman. I'm at University of Southern California. This is joint work with uh, Guillermo Baltra, who's a PhD student there. Um, and I'm an engineer uh, uh, from the internet measurement community. And I'm hoping to bring some data and an engineering perspective to some of these questions about internet fragmentation. So next slide, please. So what I really am interested in is what is this internet thing? And you may have seen this picture before. Uh, we don't know who really wrote, wrote it, but, but this is the earliest picture of the internet. Next slide, please. And the internet's a lot bigger today. So today people usually just draw a big cloud because that's much easier. Next slide, please. Um, and I've actually done, as part of my network measurement work, I've actually probed the entire IPv4 address space for the last 10 years, every, every quarter. And we draw pictures like this, which is a Hilbert curve where the brightness corresponds to how many IPv4 addresses reply to our pings. So, you know, you can actually now 
scan the whole darn thing. In fact, you can, there's open source software. Anybody can do this. Next slide, please. But what people really think about the internet today is not this, not that horrible thing on the right anymore. Oh, it's grayed out. Um, but actually what I'm supposed to be doing is using my phone, right? And which is probably going through a NAT device. In fact, half of the ITF users are going through NAT devices. And I, oftentimes I'm not actually going to servers anymore. I'm going to stuff in the cloud, which is behind a, another NAT device and all kinds of mapping. And so the internet today is much, much more complicated than those four nodes that were drawn back in the 1969-70. So next slide, please. So what this talk is about and what I'm really interested in is the internet's core. So if you think about these 4 million IP addresses in people's homes and those millions and millions of NAT devices in the cloud and in homes and phones and stuff, it's all bound together by a core of public IP addresses that get stuff places. And that's what I wanna talk about in the next slide, please. What we're here today is specifically, can this core fragment? If this core fragments, how would we know it? How would we measure it? And so we can say, oh, Russia put out a press release saying they're gonna control the internet next week as an experiment. How would we measure that? How could we prove if they did that or didn't do that? That's what I wanna ask. That's what I wanna answer. Next slide, please. So there's a whole bunch of reasons to do this. I already alluded to political pressures, um, but there's actually ITF legitimate pressures here. Well, I'm sorry, we're in the AKK. You guys care about the political pressures, but there's also technical pressures. For example, there are tier one ISPs that refuse to peer with each other because of business decisions. And they've done this for many, many years. And as a result, some people just can't talk to other people. How do we measure that? Um, the thing on the bottom right is, is internet outages. So for the last, since 2013, I've been scanning the IPv4, IPv4 internet to detect outages and, and try to estimate reliability. And then of course, there's all these architectural things like NAT and cloud and stuff like that. How do we reason about these kinds of challenges? So next slide, please. So I have a bunch of technical things that I'm not gonna go into because we don't have enough time today, but I'm happy to talk with you about them off offline, or we have a technical paper that'll be on the last slide that you can follow up with. Uh, so next slide. But what I wanna talk about today is giving a definition of the internet that lets us judge is the internet been fragmented? And let's you say to the politician, you have fragmented the internet, or no, you cannot fragment the internet. You're, you don't have that power, and give, you a, give a technical reason why. And so if we're gonna define what the internet is, we gotta start with the prior work. And so if you go back to the Surf and Con paper, they just said, oh, there's an internet. We're gonna use TCP to connect our internet. They didn't even define it. And then Postel defined it as a collection of networks. So that's a little, that's an actual definition. Thank you, John. Um, and there's a group, the Federal Networking Council in, in 1995 gave an actual more concrete thing, which talks about you gotta have an address space, you gotta have common protocols, uh, and the goal is universal data delivery. So that kind of says what it should do, but it doesn't necessarily tell us how do we know if we have one of those. So next slide, please. So my goal is to give you a definition that we can actually measure. Um, we can measure operationally. I can run pings and tell you, have you fragmented the internet? And you can tell me, maybe you don't like pings, maybe you wanna do HTTP queries or something, that, but basically, can we get an operational measurement of has the internet fragmented? Next slide, please. So to give a little bit of thought experiment about why this is hard, it's useful to think about some corner cases. So one corner case is thinking about laptops. So Lars and I were just sitting over there. We could connect our laptops with a wire. We could be using public IP addresses. He, he might have a couple of, I have a couple of those. Um, and we would be using public IP addresses to connect and communicate. Are we part of the internet? Just on a wire, right? Or on Wi-Fi if we wanna be modern, right? Um, we can talk about that. We should think about that because that's a, a legitimate corner case. Because if you scale that up, and I scale it up in a bunch of ways here, it's, you get to some interesting cases. Like what if all of China or all of Russia decides to disconnect from the internet? Are they part of the internet? So next slide, please. 
so I won't go into detail about the, wi the wireless, um, but, but it's useful to think about that very small case. Uh, a more common case on the large side is the cloud, right? There are multiple clouds that have run out of private address space today and even borrowed private address space from blocks that they maybe shouldn't have and they still run out, right? There will, become a, there will be a time when the clouds have more IPv4 space than the public IPv4 section. How do we reason about that in the internet? Another example, DISA, the a part of the Defense Department, had four slash eights that for 20 years were never routed. And then they turned them on a couple of years ago. Was that part of the IP, was that part of the internet or not? That would be something we'd like to answer. So next slide, please. So those are big cases. I already sort of alluded to the country case, right? What happens, and, and a very compelling question, question that's come up a couple of times already, what happens if a country leaves the, says, declares that we are no longer part of the internet? Or what happens if a group of countries declare that? Or what happens if a group of countries say, you, we don't like you, you are no longer part of the internet? That was one of the questions that just came up in the last session, right? We'd like to have a technical reason to answer, yes, you have expelled them from the internet, or maybe the answer is, you have broken the internet, there is no internet anymore. Um, and so I'll, I'll give you uh, ways to think about that. Next slide, please. So ultimately, I want to give a technical definition that answers those kind of corner cases um, and a question that lets us take measurements. And I'll, I'll hopefully give you a flavor of what this looks like in the brief time that I have. So next slide. I want to get to the definition. So our definition is the Internet's core is a connected component of active public IP addresses that can reach 50% of each other. And I'm gonna walk through the core parts of this, but I think that definition has a key property that lets us reason about a lot of these things that we talked about. And a couple of things that we tried to accomplish in this definition, one is it's conceptual, so it's not part of any specific measurement system because no measurement system is perfect. Two is it's operational, which means we can build a measurement system and approximate it. And even if we don't get it exactly right, you can say, oh, you did a bad job, but you can do a better, I'll do a better job. And three is it allows us to reason about the corner cases that I gave. So let me give, go into the details of why we chose these words. So the first key words are greater than 50%. And the reason I think 50% in the connected component is important is 50% makes a majority. There can only be one majority. There can only be one more than 50%. And an important property, if, if you're an old person, of the internet is that there is one internet. Okay? And so we try to capture that with this 50%. The other important property is this 50% is a property of the, the internet itself. It's a property of the addresses. It's not because John Postel said so. It's not because uh, the I, uh, IANA told us that you're part of the internet. It just emerges from use of the public address space. So there's no central authority. Next slide, please. So the second key idea is you've got to be able to reach each other. And in our experimental system, we measure that by, can you ping in both directions? Can you do ICMP probes? Um, and our goal here is to capture this idea of universal data delivery. Um, and we do this because this is what allows us to be operationalizable. This is what allows us to actually measure this and see when it's violated. Um, you, if you don't like pings, replace it with something else. Lots of people have their favorites. The detail is not important. The important thing is this is something that we can measure and not just imagine. Next slide, please. So the final part is an active public IP space. And the goal here is universal reachability, which was a long-term part of the definition of the engine that we cared about. And um, that's probably, to me, the core thing, of, the key thing about the internet core, right? Everybody can talk to everybody if they want to. That's also what distinguishes this from things behind that, which I see as second-class citizens, important, but not fully part of the internet. And also things in the cloud. You can lease an IP address. That IP address is part of the public internet, but you're, you're a second-class citizen. Um, one corollary here is there's actually two internets, I hate to say the IPv4 internet and the IPv6 internet because they have different and, and sort of overlapping, but not really, address spaces. So next slide, please. 
Um, and the final thing my hope is we've had several people give a more legalistic or more, more um, human rights perspective on this question. And that's critically important. I'm happy to, that I, I respect that point of view. I'm coming at this from an engineering point of view and I'm hoping that an engineering definition can help us uh, put a little measurement <laughs> facts that, that are less disputable um, into the policy discussions, which are also super important. So next slide, please. Um, so a little bit about how we measure this. So I've been scanning the internet, the IPv4 internet since 2006. Um, and we've been observing outages in the IPv4 internet every 11 minutes, 5 million networks uh, since 2013. Uh, so we have this outage detection system. You can see, you can sort of see, it's not very good on this slide uh, in the, on the screen. Uh, but we have different pretty pictures. You can go to the website up there, outage.ant.isi.edu, and you can look at your own pretty pictures. Um, and we see things like hurricanes, and we see Time Warner or CenturyLink here failed for a couple of hours, and we saw the war in Ukraine uh, take out parts of the Ukrainian network. So those are the kind of things that we observe in this measurement system. But I want to use this measurement system to reason about fragmentation. So next slide, please. Okay, so... Um, Originally, you know, in 2013, we started measuring outages because I wanted to make the internet more reliable. I wanted to understand how reliable it is. It um, a couple of terms seem more useful than outages, and two terms that I want to introduce are the idea of islands and peninsulas. So, an island is if you're part of the internet but you can't reach anybody else. And so, Lars and I, if we were talking on our laptops by ourselves using public IPs, we're part of the internet but we can't reach it we would be an island, okay? And DISA for years had their four slash eights, they were an island because they didn't choose to make them routable to the, to the public internet. On the other hand, this idea of a peninsula is when two people can talk, two people cannot talk, but they can both talk to a third party. So you can imagine a peninsula where you have to walk to the mainland before you walk out on, no, that doesn't quite work, anyway. <laughs> where you have to cross water to get to get to some other part of land, okay? Um, and the peninsulas are things we see today. We see tier one ISPs that refuse to peer. Their customers cannot talk to each other, but of course their customers can both talk to USC because we, we peer with everybody, right? And so if you could relay your traffic through USC, they could talk, but, but we don't relay traffic because we're not an ISP. So that's what we mean by peninsula. And these concepts, I think, help us reason about uh, partial connectivity and fragmentation. So next slide, please. Okay, so islands, as I said, are when a bunch of computers seem to be part of the internet, but they're not reachable. And they're not reachable from the core, from that 50% connected component. And we've actually measured this a bunch of times. So this graph on the bottom is, what is this? This is since 2017, data taken from ISI. And there have been like, I don't know, Part of the graph is cut off the slide, but there have been like six or eight times when ISI was disconnected from the internet because our routers failed or, or our ISP cut us off or something. I mean, we didn't pay the rent or something, I don't know. Um, but where ISI could talk internally, but we couldn't reach the internet, we were islands. And so we've measured that, we've seen that. Next slide, please. So peninsulas, as I said, are when two locations can only reach each other can, can both reach a third place, but can't reach each other directly. And this is an old, old phenomena. Randy Bush talked about it more than 10 years ago. Um, and uh, people have built whole systems to exploit this more than 10 years ago again. Um, uh, we see some examples of this today. So there are tier one ISPs that decline to pair with each other, at least in IPv6 space. Um, and we also see routing misconfigurations and firewalls that could result in this. So next slide, please. I want to give one example that we observed in our data. So we scanned the whole internet and we noticed this case where several ASs in Poland uh, were reachable from one of our observers, but not reachable from two other observers. And we have six observers scanning the whole, uh, scanning as much of the IP internet as we can. Uh, and so the one in Los Angeles could reach Poland or these specific people in Poland, the others could not. So we tried to understand what happened. So next slide, please. 
So we actually mapped it out and got trace routes before and after and, and did some looking. It's complicated. <laughs> there were multiple upstreams for this ISP in Poland. Uh, and it turned out because of who peers with whom and who exchanges traffic with whom, one of the people retained connectivity when there was an outage in Cogent during this and the others lost connectivity. Their, their traffic was black holed. So this is the kind of thing that happens. This lasted, uh, I forget, it was like an hour or something. It wasn't that long. But these kind of things happen operationally today due to routing problems. So next slide, please. Oh, this, this is what happened during, right? So one person could still route through one of the upstreams, but something happened in the others that, that caused it to fail. So next slide, please. So we have two algorithms in our technical paper, which is listed at the bottom here. Uh, they're called Taitao and Chiloe that measure outages and peninsulas by analyzing our data taken from f six different sites pinging the IPv4 internet. Um, you, I'm happy, we make the data publicly available. I'm happy to share it if you wanna look at it. Um, I'd love your input on the algorithms if you would like. Uh, next slide, please. Um, let's see, so the basic idea, I only wanna go into detail about one of the algorithms. The basic idea about peninsula detection is basically observe from many places, from physically different places. So our six sites are physically in six locations around the world. If one site can reach it, but other sites can't, you've got a peninsula. So next slide. That's an informal description of the Taitao algorithm. Um, so we've applied this for a while. We validated uh, against an, another measurement system that does trace routes, gives us some more detail. Next slide, please. I'm not gonna go into details on the next slide, but it, when we validated it, we get pretty good precision and recall. It's not perfect, it's an, you know, measurement is an imperfect science. Um, I'm, you can look into the details in this in the paper, but we did try to quantify it. We did try to put error bars on it. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanna convey two key measurement results. So the first measurement result is, if we're measuring the IP4 internet from six places, do we get the same answer? And do we get the same answer when we combine results from one of them, from two of them, from all six of them, that sort of question. And so on these graphs, moving to the right uses data from more and more people. And on the left is two people or three people or four observers, three observers, two observers, and so on. And the left graph is how much of the internet is reachable. And the right graph is how much of the internet is unreachable, if everybody has to agree. And the key point here is um, on the graph on the right, you can see it converges. After about four sites, we're pretty much in the flat line of the slope. So our argument is with three or four physically distinct sites, you can get a pretty good view of what the internet looks like. Um, and, and that's important because we can't measure from millions of sites, not practical. Next slide, please. So, the other thing I wanted to put in the middle is peninsulas. How often do our six sites disagree? And the key thing to measure, observe here is the scales on the middle and the right graph are exactly the same. And roughly the number of peninsulas we see is equal to the number of outages we see. So everybody is worried about internet outages. Is, is my routing working for a long time? People don't often think about partial connectivity probably because it doesn't affect everybody, but it happens all the time. And in fact, partial connectivity happens just as much according to this data as outages. And so that's something we need to be thinking about. So next slide, please. Um, we also looked at how long peninsulas last and it's kind of like you might expect, it's sort of bimodal. Almost all of them are really short. And the, the middle graph is a CDF of peninsulas with different, slightly different definitions. Um, you would expect lots of short peninsulas because that's what routing does, right? Routing takes a while to converge. And so when routing is not quite converged, you get partial connectivity. That we knew 10 years ago from Randy Bush and other people who have published papers on that. The more interesting thing is some things last a day or 10 days or many, many days. There are places in the internet you just can't get here, there from here. Those are probably partial connectivity by design or by business dispute or those kinds of things. And those are things I think we need to wrestle with as, a, as an internet community. Next slide, please. 
Um, now, the final thing, this is a fragmentation talk. And so one of the things we looked at in terms of fragmentation is, can somebody control the internet? And we heard yesterday from Nick's talk, right, that, that the US runs a majority of X, where X is many things about the internet. <laughs> um, we looked at address space. Who controls the IP address space and therefore controls the internet by our definition? And the answer is right now, nobody. No single RIR, regional registry, or no single country has a majority of IP addresses. And therefore, uh, by our definition, it, the internet is, has to be a international collaboration. Um, however, there are a couple of people that are close. <laughs> And if they got together with their friends, um, we might have a different answer. So uh, next slide, please. So just to wrap up, uh, I wanted to, I want, first I want to offer the question, how, what is the internet's core? How do we define that? Can we define that uh, uh, experimentally? I think that's an important question that we haven't thought about uh, until recently. I have an answer to that question, which is my, the definition I gave, greater than 50% of the connected core. And we have some data from an imperfect measurement system to try to give you some numbers for that. Um, and so I would love your feedback on your, and thoughts about, does this help you uh, reason about questions about fragmentation? Um, and let me open it up to questions then. So. And I don't have access to any of these fancy IETF tools. So Mallory will be helping me, I'm sure. Yep, I can see the queue. Um, Matt, you're up. Uh, how did you define that 50%? Is that the same 50% for, for everybody? Because I can imagine situations where the whole world is peninsula such that each of us can see 50, a different 50%. Uh, so it's 50% of the public IP address space. So you can talk to IANA about who gets that. Um, and no, you can't have more than 50% of but, that if you take the, the two, two, two to the 32 but, addresses. But we can have overlapping. We, we can each have 45%, which is the same, and 10%, which is different. Uh, if you have 45%, you do not have the internet. So, so let, no, maybe no. let's follow up with this outline. Yeah. The goal of the definition is to preclude that. So if I blew it, I, I want to hear your, your specific case. Uh, who's next? Uh, Nikita, and I'm going to actually close the queue now because we've got kind of a long list, which is great, but we have to, yep, thanks. Uh, so go ahead, Nikita. Hi, Nikita Borisov, University of Illinois. Uh, I just want to clarify, when you say a public reachable address, uh, you mean uh, you're able to reach somebody who was assigned that address by the IANA authority, right? It's not so somebody who responds to that address. What are you asking about squatters? <laughs> or, well, I mean, I mean, I, I guess there's, there's two angles of it. One is potential squatters, like you say, and the other is that it, if, uh, you know, somebody, if the, uh, you have a country that disconnects that no longer has oh. any reason to not allocate those addresses. That right. So obviously from. addresses, many addresses are used ephemerally. Um, we consider that, um, you know, um, <laughs> that's a long but, discussion. But, but, but uh, um, I guess my, the question is, how do you oper uh, operationalize that in the sense that, you know, it's easy to, it's possible to respond to things without, actually yeah. having so that's a long discussion i'm sorry that it seems to be a repeat refrain it's a long discussion okay um you have to consider obviously the fact that many addresses are used ephemerally um there are ways to handle that um they grow out of our work measuring internet outages where we know that not the entire slice 24 is going to respond to pings um <laughs> so okay yes good point uh mm -hmm. long Thank you. That's I'll, an important I'll, I'll component of the measure. And, uh, yeah. Look into it. Thank you. Uh, Dave? Oh, uh, I'm sorry. No, no, there's yeah. a few. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah I think Dave. I'm next. Um, <laughs> Dave Planka. Uh, thanks, John. I think it's interesting and useful to talk about ICMP reachability as a simple way to introduce the idea of what the internet is and fragmentation and partitioning. But we know that it, the engineering people know that that's, the internet can be working fine without ICMP without reachability pings? in either protocol version. Are you, are you blocking my pings now? Um, I'm not, but some of my friends are. I know that and, your friends want to. And so, so, so where, well, the question I want to ask you and for people to think about is what is the best passive means by which we can mm. measure so that we aren't 
shooting ourselves in the foot and saying the internet's partitioned when it's not? Yeah, that's a great question. So basically you're saying for a variety of reasons, people don't all want to respond to active probes. Maybe we should consider passive means in this equation. It, it, can, I, can I say that sure. a little differently? Um, you don't have to give permission to people, parties you don't know, to observe whether or not you're ha you rendezvoused with some service on the internet or having a conversation. So the internet works and is not partitioned, is yeah. not fragmented, even though you don't do that. So what? It, so what? It, the open question is, what is the best alternatives that you know of uh, so that we could include passive measurement? So passive is awesome. I'm working on passive right now. Passive is hard because, you know, well, we're, we're about human rights here, right? And we can't always observe stuff. And most of us can't. And maybe, maybe we shouldn't. Maybe we but shouldn't. some of us observe some things. That's a long conversation. I think passive has a vital role to play in this question. Um, my definition right now is based on active because active gets pretty good coverage, especially in IPv4. And I know what coverage I get with active. And with passive, there's a lot of other factors that come into play. So great. That's the next paper. Um, not this paper. Any other, who's next? Hi, uh, Q Mysel. You have six vantage points, if I remember correctly. Yep. Um, that's How good. can that possibly work? No, 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 that's not the question. My oh. question is, um, are you aware, have you looked into the right atlas? For... Oh, yeah, of course. Okay, and why, why did you not use so this? So we, we, if you read the paper, we compare against Ripe Atlas and use it for a validation source. Right. Uh, Ripe Atlas does not probe nearly as fast as we probe. Um, and so we run our own probers be, uh, because we don't want to abuse, abuse Ripe Atlas. Okay, we certainly enough. compare to it. It's a valuable, it's, it's a very valuable source to compare to. Um, I th hope that the graphs that I showed you suggest that six sites, provided they're physically distributed, actually do an amazingly good job. So you get roughly the same results from your measurements as you get from so the Ripe Atlas. So it's complicated. Okay, of um, course it is. <laughs> we believe that Ripe Atlas confirms the results that we see. Yes. I cannot reproduce our results with Ripe Atlas because they don't probe it, the course. heck yeah, yeah. out of the internet. But like they, we do. they at least agree with each other. But their results confirm our conclusions. Okay, good, thank you. You're welcome, good question. And we also compare against Kata Arc, which is another measurement system of much smaller than Ripe Atlas, but another independent larger than us. They have about 130 sites when we used it. Tobias yeah. uh, uh, Siebich, Max Planck Institute for Informatics, basically following up on Q. Um, so you talked about um, Ripe Atlas sees that what you are seeing is there. Um, which I don't doubt, but I'm actually interested in, do you have any plans to increase your resolution? Because there are certainly things you do not see as soon as they get smaller scale. Imagine, for example, within one country where you do not have a probe, um, an ISP blocking to um, major parts of the internet, but not involving your probes, right. and like not to a local ISP, basically forming like tiny peninsulas of adjacent right. networks. So that's a great question. So the question was, could we, you, perhaps, could Ripe Atlas or, or greater numbers of vantage points increase our resolution? So there's a lot packed into that. Our resolution right now is we usually look at, think about slash 24s as the finest granularity. Um, we are very limited in what claims we make about islands because of our measurement methodology. So we did use Ripe Atlas. In fact, we use Ripe Atlas to estimate that. Uh, to complement, because 10,000 is way more than six. Um, for peninsulas, I think our numbers are pretty good because uh, that depends on do we get the independent paths into the target, and six is pretty good. I mean, 10,000 is better, I suppose. Um, I guess so. I guess my suggestion is we have pretty good resolution, but of course we could do better, and we would love to do better. So, uh, uh, Nick. Hi, yeah, thanks for this really great talk, Nick Merrill, UC Berkeley. Um, I really love this crisp and satisfying definition of what makes the internet, you know, the internet. And what I interpret this as is which internet is really the canonical internet, which you define mm -hmm. by this majority yeah. criterion. I would love to hear you spell out for me why it is important to understand which internet is canonical. Why is it important uh, to understand why is there only so, one? And as one quick follow-on question, 
How do you think about a scenario, unlikely though it may be, that there is no internet that meets this criteria of 50% yeah. connectivity? So uh, if you didn't notice, so I have gray hair, right? I'm old. And some of us remember when the internet was going to be above all this government stuff and it was going to save the world and all that. Um, one of the things that we thought back in those happy days was that there would be one internet. And so that's baked into this definition. And that's baked into the, uh, the, the definitions from prior work that I gave at the beginning of the talk. Um, one can certainly imagine that's foolish. We want multiple internets. We want sovereignty. And, and that's a political point one can take. That's not what you were advocating, but um, that is a different perspective. And now I'm sorry. What was the, I lost the other part of your. How does the model work if there is no internet by which 50% Oh, yes. And an important result of our definition, if you believe our definition is, it is possible to end the internet. If half of the world says we hate you and the other half has, says we hate you too, uh, we can each take our pie and go home and neither of us has half a pie and there is no pie. So that I think is an important result. And actually that's part of the reason I wanted a crisp definition because some of us uh, would like there to continue to be an internet and would like there for people to think very hard before they make decisions even against bad people uh, that would perhaps jeopardize there being one internet. Because once you break it, it's awfully hard to put back, in my opinion. But that's just my opinion. You can take our definition and do other things with it too. So uh, thank you, great question. Are yeah, we... and I think it was a rather useful note to end on. Once oh. it's fragmented, it is very it. hard to put back together. You know, it's a, it's, it's a yeah, well, moral you. of the story, folks. Thank you so much, John. Right, we have a final speaker. Uh, Stephen, you're up. Um, this will be on, um, I don't think we've linked the draft to the meeting materials, sorry for that oversight, but um, I believe you've also presented elsewhere this week, so. Okay. Go ahead. Hi, uh, so it, it was 20 minutes or? Yeah. Great, okay. Uh, so yeah, with this is, it's no longer a draft, it's an RFC. So uh, RFC 9446, uh, we're just talking about, which is essentially, a look back uh, ten, to 10 years ago and what's happened since and, and before as well. So next slide. And the authors are myself, uh, Farzana, Bruce, and Steve Bellavan. Steven, you should be able to use the clicker. You should be. Oh, I, I... <laughs> or do you want me to do it for you? I can also do that. Oh, she's saying thank you. I want you to do it. Please click. OK. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a decade since, and uh, essentially the RFC is just a collection of four separate essays. Uh, the goal is really, you know, also to look back, it might help people who weren't around. How many people were kind of around about the IETF when the Snowden stuff was all happening? Okay, so it's like half-ish of the room. Um, so it might be useful for people who weren't around. Um, otherwise, I think it might be useful to kind of think about what we've, you know, what we've done and what we haven't yet done and what other people have been doing. Uh, so hopefully it's useful for that. And Elliot Lear, who's the independent submissions editor, actually initiated this. He pinged uh, the four of us and said, would you write that? And we did. And he helped a bit with kind of cat herding. So uh, he didn't want to be added as a co-author, but he, he deserves a bunch of the credit for it as well. So next slide. Uh, yeah, so it's, as I said, it's kind of four essays. Uh, Bruce's essay is basically mostly stuff he wrote back in 2013, but that wasn't published uh, for reasons he explains. I kind of wrote a bit uh, about what happened around here um, in the ITF and so on. Uh, Farzana considers uh, the whole thing from a human rights perspective. And Steve basically starts with prehistory through the 90s crypto wars uh, and Snowden and up until today as well. So he gives it, it's a nice historical kind of description of crypto war like things. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to kind of go through the, the historical part of the draft, really. Uh, there's a bunch of opinions there as well, which is mostly what I'll, I'll be talking about today. Uh, if you know, go read the draft if you're interested. So next slide. For those who weren't around, uh, so this was back in 2013 um, in, in June, and then there was an ITF meeting shortly afterwards where there was more news coming out. Uh, so Snowden has had you know, gone on the run from the NSA, had released a whole bunch of 
highly classified documents to reporters uh, from you know, most, I think, The Guardian initially and a few other newspapers, uh, who kind of carefully curated the, 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 the collection and published stories that were pretty interesting about basically how the, the NSA and Friends, the Five Eyes signals agencies, uh, had been you know, far more intrusive. The, the scope of their kind of uh, snooping was, was worse than people generally had appreciated by a lot. Um, now, I mean, you know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't you know, a lot of the kind of attacks weren't necessarily new technical surprises, but the kind of the scale of it was basically. Uh, and again, if you're not familiar with it or you've forgotten, there's a, I think the, the Wikipedia has a nice kind of timeline with uh, lots of reminders of all the stuff we saw then. Uh, and again, if you, if you read the draft, there's a good few references to, to all the kind of stuff you need. So next slide. So, and I guess then what happened since? So, so, there's, so there is some good news. Uh, so if you look at this, this is a graphic from uh, Mozilla, uh, or sorry, from, from Let's Encrypt, but based on Mozilla stats, uh, of you know, browser page openings using Firefox that are using HTTPS versus HTTP. And yeah, if you go back to 2013, it was maybe 30%. It was the common thing that, you know, there, maybe a website would, would turn to TLS just to let you enter the password and then go back to, to HTTP. Uh, that was pretty common back then. And that, that, that has changed significantly. Uh, and not just in the sense of uh, what, uh, Firefox and websites and so on, but also because of Let's Encrypt itself, uh, which basically has helped to get over a lot of the, the, the problems we had with, uh, with getting TLS well deployed at scale. Uh, so there's been really, really good progress there, I think. We could kind of ask ourselves, why is it kind of flattening at the top? Is there anything we could do to get from that 80 or 90% figure to, to toward more better, closer towards 100? I think that's worth uh, thinking about. Um, maybe the answer is there's not much you can do with that at that point, but I don't know. We should think about it. Next slide. There's kind of similar good news uh, in email. Um, and again, the, if you look at email back in 2013, a lot of people probably weren't even measuring how much SMTP traffic was over TLS. So this is measuring server-to-server uh, -server encryption of email traffic, not uh, using PGP or SMIME. It's not this. It's, this is just uh, SMTP over TLS. And yeah, so again, it was, you know, it was, to a large extent, it wasn't really being measured, I think. I'm not sure where they got the stats from going back that far. Are. But these are stats for essentially what Google see on inbound encryption of their SMTP over TLS. And yeah, again, we just kind of see that uh, in this case, the graph went up in sort of large bumps that, that kind of reflects the deployment of mail, that there's large mail providers. Uh, but it was the case uh, earlier on in this kind of whole process that a whole bunch of large email providers would say things like, we couldn't possibly turn on TLS. It would be too expensive or things would break. Turned out they could, they did it and it worked. Um, and again, on the right-hand side of this graph, you'll see that uh, I'm not sure why it's getting wiggly, in, the, in more recent times, I think that would be interesting to try and think about. Um, so again, there might be more to do, uh, but you know, sometimes it's the stats at 96%, maybe that gap is uh, to 100 is kind of not that easily closed, but why it's kind of wiggling around might be interesting to look at. Next slide. Similarly, I mean, so it's, you know, one of the reactions obviously was encrypting more stuff uh, and, and doing more work on encrypting protocols in the ITF. Another kind of part of the reaction uh, was, you know, to, you know depending less on fixed long-term identifiers. And that's kind of uh, shown up here by looking at MAC address randomization. And this is a paper from a PET symposium a couple of years ago, uh, where they're looking at different MAC address randomization mechanisms in Android. And again, you can see the kind of deployment here is kind of driven to some extent by new Android releases and handsets being kind of people buying new handsets and then having new operating systems and so on. And the weird way that those things get updated. Um, but what you can see essentially is that the, the, you know, there was some MAC address randomization. It's kind of getting better. It's the, the, the mechanisms are getting a bit better. They're getting a bit more commonly deployed. Uh, and so that's good. And again, this is, this is just Android. Uh, other vendors and, and other people using MAC addresses are doing other things too. Next slide. Uh, there's also middling news. Like not everything is, is, a, is a, a, a big success. This is uh, some Cloudflare data looking at uh, DNS queries arriving at a recursive resolver. Uh, and basically, the top line there is the plain text stuff, which is what we'd like to see go away to some extent. Uh, and the, the green is, is DO, and I think the yellow is DOT. Um, so that's encrypted DNS. So basically, what we can see there is, yeah, something around 20%-ish. Um, of DNS traffic arriving at that recursive might now be encrypted. And there was obviously something weird happened uh, at that, that time when the, the graph goes down in terms of DOE deployment. I don't know what happened. Uh, again, it'd be interesting to look at. 
I guess we might, you know, if we want to encrypt DNS traffic, which I think uh, I would argue we, we should, because of, you know, it's a lot of data that you're exposed, metadata that you're exposing to the internet and you don't really need to. We have protocols for fixing that. We could try and work on getting those better deployed. Next slide. Okay, so then the, 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 the only other things I have are a couple of, a couple of the kind of non-historical, more conclusionary or opinionated bits uh, pulled out from each of the essays that I thought were interesting. So I did the selection here. This isn't Bruce's four points. This is me picking out four things that I thought were interesting. Uh, so one of the things was, the, one of the Snowden documents was this implant catalog that uh, was an NSA kind of product that they would, uh, you know, a catalog of products from which their customers could choose different ways to kind of tap into things and so on. Uh, and one of the points Bruce makes is he, he, he thinks that the source of that might not have been Snowden, it might have been somebody else, uh, which is kind of interesting. But also it reminds us that since 10 years ago when Snowden kind of initially dropped a whole bunch of stuff, there have been other kind of leaks of various kinds from NSA as well and from other kind of agencies. So the idea that their, their stuff is, their internal secrets are going to remain secret uh, is presumably you know, demonstrated not to be quite true. Uh, another good point I think Bruce makes is that everything we learned back then is 10 years out of date or maybe more because the documents were older than, than new. Uh, so we shouldn't be depending on thinking that just what we, we found out then is what they're doing now, because I'm sure that's not what they're doing now. They're doing other things. For example, even though we might be encrypting more traffic, perhaps these agencies are just going and buying that, that information from brokers who've been collecting it because of advertising purposes. And, and you know, maybe it'd be interesting if we cared a bit about that. Uh, another point Bruce makes, and I, I make, also made in my section, uh, and I think Steve did too, is that back in 2013, everybody was pretty pissed off with these guys. Um, there was a real sense of annoyance. You, you can look back at the video from the November uh, uh, 2013 ITF 88 plenary, and people were kind of annoyed about the whole thing. Uh, and rightly so, I think. But that annoyance has kind of faded over the years to some extent, uh, which is kind of a pity, I think. And again, despite the kind of outcry and all the, all the media, not much uh, visibly changed in terms of the US government's approach, uh, according to Bruce, which I think is a fair point. Next slide. Four things I said, we, we, we get pushback against this, right? So if you, if you turn on encryption for something, you get pushback from, what I, from my perception, and not everybody would agree with this, from kind of two classes of, of people or two classes of arguments. One is you're breaking my shit, stop it. And people do object to that, but then they tend to get over it because they find new ways of doing things. So for example, in the mail case, the people were reluctant to turn on SMTP over TLS because they thought it would break things. After they turned it on, it didn't break things too much. I remember being at a meeting when, back when I was on the ISG, we were at a meeting with a mobile uh, telephone operator who was literally banging the table because uh, at, at that time, Gmail had turned on. No, it wasn't Gmail, sorry. The, uh, the video was one. Huh? YouTube, sorry, yes. Yeah, I don't use these things. YouTube had turned on encryption and this mobile operator was saying, this is breaking our network. And of course it didn't. So, so that's one kind of class of person who doesn't like uh, us to improve security. Another class is just those people who, for whatever reason, would rather we didn't encrypt things so they can still see them. And again, maybe some of these people have you know, good arguments that they, in, their, in their minds for doing it, but I think overall on balance, it's a, I think it's a losing argument and, uh, and we should treat it like that. Tobias, I guess I'll take questions at the end if that's okay. Okay, good. Um, so we did produce an RFC uh, 7258, which I kind of helped write which basically said that the kind of monitoring that the NSA and co were doing was an attack on the internet and we should, we should do our best to kind of uh, mitigate it. And we did, we did a lot of work. We improved with TLS 1.3 and so on and so on. But what we didn't do was remember that RFC 7258 does not say the bad actor must be a government. And one thing that I think is interesting, we clearly have an easier time considering governments as bad actors when they're doing these kind of things than we have considering our employers being bad actors when our employers are doing these kind of things. Now that's kind of understandable, but I think it's also true and something we could think about. And as a result of that, I think regulators are getting more interested in what's going on in terms of regulating for privacy and so on. And, you know, so that's the likes of the Digital Markets Act affecting, causing the, the Mimi group to be created. We could have done that without regulators having to tell us. Uh, so I think the lack of kind of taking action on these things can lead to regulation, which might stymie the kind of permissionless innovation that really was the, in large part, or some part, the foundation of the kind of success of the internet. Uh, and last point I'd like to add in mind, I think we should think about the ethics of, the, of what we do a bit more and not just the kind of engineering and process stuff we always think about. Uh, and that's kind of largely, if you, if, you, if you look at the second bullet that kind of leads to that. So next slide. 
Rosanna, uh, again, coming, coming from a human rights perspective, uh, a good point I think she made, it's hard to, it's hard to make, do an empirical measurement of the effect, right? You can measure things like the encryption of TLS traffic and so on, but it's hard to kind of measure the effect that, that, that Snowden's documents had on the internet. She also, I think, fairly says, we never considered human rights very much around the IETF, and we probably still don't, uh, despite the good work happening here, we're trying to you know, move that along. But I think we, you know, there's clearly a long way to go. Uh, I think she makes a point that's maybe not so much driven by Snowden, but that the evolution from who is to ORDAP, which I think she considers an improvement in from a human rights perspective, uh, was very, very slow. And, and probably the evolution was more driven by commercial uh, issues and by regulatory issues than it was by actually considering human rights. And I think she finally kind of recommends that uh, we could do better in terms of uh, doing impact assessments of the things that happen here and the deployments thereof in terms of how those protocols and the deployments have an impact on which human rights and on Hughes human rights that we could actually do better by doing some kind of analysis there. I think this working group is, or this research group uh, has been uh, helping us to do and encouraging us to do, which is good. Next slide. Steve, uh, basically, uh, you know, his, his essay kind of goes way back in time, starts with, uh, with, with, with Julius Caesar or Caesar ciphers and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, so basically he makes the point that governments uh, have long, 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 for a long time, and probably always will, not like anybody else using encryption except themselves. Fair enough. Um, but, I mean, I think in this world, I think as, as John's kind of presentation previously said, the internet is something we all depend on. So that's, that kind of approach, I think, doesn't really work. We should re realize, I think Steve says, that you know, spies are going to spy. Um, no matter if we do better on encryption, they might go and attack the databases. If we protect the databases, they might attack the, the DOM zero in, in the virtualization. If we, attack, if we do better there, they might attack the hardware, or they might send in the lawyers and basically attack it that way. So they're still going to try and uh, work around what we do. But well, we should do it anyway, because if we don't do it, they won't have to even work around it. And we kind of may be able to make things more expensive for some people to, to, to spy at this kind of scale that we're, we saw in the NSA case. And again, like I, I think Steve also points out that you know, even if our ITF protocols were, were super and great, which they're, yeah, they're not all, um, even if that was the case, you know, we have to kind of also consider you know, operations, implementations, ransomware attacks, and other kind of things that, that might affect it. And worry more about metadata, which I think is, 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 a, is a good point. Uh, next slide, and I think that was the last one. So concluding, uh, so I think, I think the whole, it was a big deal, I think. I think uh, if you go and look back at, the, at what the IETF kind of did, there was a lot of work happened in and around the IETF and the broader kind of internet community and in a bunch of vendors and in a bunch of open source kind of uh, worlds. A lot of work happened as a result of this. And I think that was good. We, it's probably stuff we should have been doing anyway, but uh, we did a good bit of work, so that's good. It's not done, there's more to do. Um, however, unfortunately, I think the internet is kind of worse than it was 10 years ago for a lot of people. Um, and I think we should reflect on that. And my main takeaway, having kind of thought about it while writing this stuff, was that I think we should really can consider applying uh, RFC 7258, which is also BCP 188, uh, to the kind of people who are commercial snoops, um, basically around the advertising industry. I think we should, if we were doing the right thing, apply you know, as much energy to try and to mitigate the attack from those people as we did from the NSA. And I think the next slide just says thanks. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Um, I will use Chair's prerogative to remind folks on the question, or the, the, the thing that Bruce brought up about leaks is that our last meeting, 116 in Yokohama, we had Michael Lee come, who presented on methodologies for actually um, processing all of the massive amounts of leaks that are happening, so much that it is difficult to even know what people are linking now. There's just so much online available. And so he has come up with some really great um, sort of automated techniques for going through all of the, you know, all of that trove of information. Uh, Tobias. Hi. Yeah, so uh, Tobias Fibich, uh, Max Planck Institute for Informatics. Um, I, I would like to put a hole in your uh, rosy email world. So on a measurement <laughs> on um, a little bit more than uh, 1,030 domains um, on their sending behavior, we see that uh, there is opportunistic uh, TLS for 92.52% of them. So opportunistic accepting any yeah. certificate. Falling back to plain text, the support for plain text is 97.37%. So there's still 5% who only do plain text, also granted. Um, and MTASDS is only in 16.35% of cases and Dane in 27.58. Sure. So we, we, 
we might look good in terms of TLS deliverability, but not that good. Sure, I, mean, I think that's a fair point. Yeah, I mean, nonetheless, I, you know, what, our, what that slide was trying to show is compared to 2013, we are in a better place. But yes, opportunistic TLS in, in SMTP is kind of predominates, yeah. But I, from the ITF point of view, though, I'd say, you know, we have kind of at least tried to address this with Dane and with MPA SDS. Maybe we need to revisit that if the deployments are not kind of uh, working out as planned. Bill. Hi, Steve. Uh, yeah, great presentation. I agree with all of it. Really? But. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, done, one, so. Of the <laughs> one of the things that's been very apparent over the years has been the hack frame and leak pattern where you leak a bunch of documents and you spin them and I think that we have been spun a bit in that what a lot of people took away from the Snowden breach was that our governments are the singular enemy. And there, is a much, there are many more out there. For me, the big change that Snowden made was that you know, I came to the ITF and people were calling me an imbecile, a conspiracy nut, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because I had told people that the Iranian Revolutionary Guard had knocked over one of our data centers. And, you know, when you mention nation-state attacks, people used to t teach, treat that as, you know, you're a blithering idiot, no, you're an egotist and so on. But, you know, governments do hack. That's the thing that we should be taking away from it. Mm -hmm. And we've got to design our systems to be resistant. The big takeaway for me reading through those documents and I've discussed it with people who were on the other side of this, was that the NSA posture was entirely driven by attack. And that that was the only thing that they were focused on. And if you look at what happened afterwards, when in 2016, we had the biggest attack on democracy ever, aided and abetted in, many, in two countries by very senior politicians who I call traitors. And that was possible because we had our priorities wrong. And if we're going to protect democracy, we need strong cryptography everywhere. Sure. I, I guess I, I don't disagree with you either. <laughs> Andrew. Hi, Stephen. Uh, uh, Andrew Campling. Um, just picking up on your sort of conclusion slide, um, and you, in, in fact, you referenced it elsewhere in the presentation uh, about applying RFC 7258 to um, the commercial snoops, as you've characterized them. Um, I, I, I do wonder whether, whether with hindsight, this, the community paid far too much attention to or, or put far too much weight on bad stuff done by governments, partly because of it, the predilection of some in the community to not like government, while simultaneously turning a blind eye completely to the bad stuff that, in some cases, their employers do and continue to do to this day. Because if I look at the scale of surveillance undertaken by some of the social media platforms, you know, they're surveilling several billion people every day. You know, this, they're doing stuff that governments can only dream about. Um, and is it an unintended consequence of some of this, the measures that have been taken to counter the bad stuff done by government that actually makes it easier to hide some of the activities undertaken under the, sort of the surveillance capitalism banner because it's far harder to spot that happening than it would have been previously so are we enabling the bad stuff done by this sector to actually continue and arguably get worse so um kind of don't agree i mean i think you make some fair points but i kind of i think overall i i don't think people reacted to the snowden documents because of a, an anti-government kind of feeling i think it was because it was somebody who was caught kind of trying to break the internet or snoop on the internet um, if, if it had have been you know, a large mega company's documents that had leaked showing the same thing, I think the reaction would have been similar. Where I think it is noteworthy is 
it, it's much easier to react against, let's say, governments because they don't employ most of the people here. And it's harder to actually piss off your employer and have them send you to an expensive hotel for a week. <laughs> so it's just, I think it's just a human nature thing. Um, in terms of the actions we've taken, so in, encrypting more does make you know, it makes it harder to look at traffic because that's the point. Uh, it does not make it impossible. So I have a colleague, Doug Leith, who's done some great work on essentially reverse engineering a bunch of the things that mobile phone keyboards do, calling home to, their, uh, to the people who, who engineer that bit of software. And you can find it. It, it is a little bit more work. It requires more technical skill to do it. Uh, but the fact that we're encrypting the traffic, even as it gets called home to the, the keyboard maker, uh, is a good thing still, I would argue. Alyssa. Alyssa Cooper. Um, just wanted to object to this characterization that the community turned a blind eye completely to the, this other class of, sure. of privacy issues um, because just reflecting my own experience as somebody who worked on privacy quite a bit in the ITF prior to this event sure. and witnessing like a complete sea change in our ability to have anybody listen or take seriously any of the arguments that were made um, before or since about data minimization in general. It's like night and day, right? Like it was <laughs> this, you know, very challenging effort to get traction on any of the stuff. And then 2013 happened and it, like the, the difference in, in the uh, interest in the community and the general topic was very palpable. So I don't think it's really the case. And, and many people who you know, worked on the things before and continue to work on them, not just in the context of defending against pervasive surveillance. So um, yeah, I just, I just don't think that's, that's really accurate. And I, I think it's, it's a great idea to you know, continue to try to key off of that to expand the set of protections that we can get for more different kinds of threats. Um, and I think there's a lot of people who are, who are doing that now. Yeah, yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, I, I, if I use the phrase blind eye... No, I, Andrew I did. Sorry? It was not... Andrew did. Oh, sorry. You did. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, it's cause I, you know, I think there's a, you know, there's a lot of fine people who work for some of the companies who are those commercial snoops who do great work. Um, that is the case. But I think as a community, I think, it, I think the criticism of us, us as a community is, I think, something that's worth thinking about. We're going to close the queue, but go ahead, Vittorio. Hi, Victoria Bartolo, Open Exchange. So, well, I was a bit surprised because I hadn't read the, the, the document. So I expected this to be like uh, what we need to know now more than a recollection of I mean, what happened in these 10 years. So I actually started to think, and, I mean, uh, what, what's the next challenge? I mean, do, is there any similar challenge? To me, the, the, I mean, the, the big challenge of today, comparable to what was this one 10 years ago, is the centralization thing. And also, the, I mean, what is really different now, in my opinion, I mean, 10 years ago when you, because I wasn't here, I mean, I was in the industry, but not attending ITF, but when, when the ITF started encrypting everything, we were still mostly in the world in which you had one client and one server, which were run by independent companies and they were speaking to an open interoperable protocol. Now we are in, in a situation in which in most cases, especially the average user of the internet has a client and a server that are written and run by the same company and they're opaque. So they're often not open, you don't even know what they do. And so the encrypted channel between the two is actually a way to cut out even you as a user from checking what's happening there. So I, I think this is changing the, the effect of, and, and what I'm saying is that it's not that we should not encrypt the stuff anymore, but maybe that's the next challenge. Or how do we guarantee some kind of scrutiny to the end user in a world in which the client and server collude because they are run mostly by the same company and they are proprietary. Often they're not open source software and you don't really know what they talk about and which data they exchange. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's, it is fair to say that centralization is, is, is a, a more pressing matter than it was 10 years ago. I think that's utterly fair. Um, I mean, I, you know, I also, one of the challenges with dealing, let's say, with the commercial kind of snoops is that a lot of what you would have to do doesn't really involve internet protocols. So doing it here might not be that easy. Just, you know, we can probably have more effect by encrypting protocols here or defining how to do that than in terms of you know, whether two companies have some side agreement to copy a database fields to each other. That's not really something the ITF can tackle so well, but you know, there we are. There we are. Thank you very much, Stephen. Okay. And to all the authors on that draft, it's really excellent. If people, sorry, it's not a draft, it's an RFC. Please read it, it's quite good. Um, right, so we, I'm sorry, um, we're always behind time, but I think the discussion's been really great. So if we could quickly move to draft 
guidelines. Um, I think we just need an update. And then probably the only other thing we'll have time to talk about is, well, we'll, we'll see. But yeah, Gershabad, you're there. So let's take it one step at a time. Go on draft guidelines. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, just for context, draft guidelines update uh, 82 AP, uh, which was the first RFC published um, in this group. Um, the uh, just just on status, I think it went to IRSD ballot in December 22, and uh, after that we did have a late review, and so the last. Um, uh, few months have been focused on addressing those. Uh, some of the issues were dealt on GitHub and Office, but like um, uh, the major changes are in like the pseudonymity and anonymity sections. Um, the rest were most mostly like clarifications in text. Uh, we did upload a new version to Data Tracker two weeks ago, uh, but I think only one issue is left now. But uh, unless the group is also reading emails religiously there, I don't think that they might have seen the recent discussion. And it's um, only related to Echo's comment on content agnosticism. Um, I, I do believe we're like in good shape and like have addressed most issues in the late review. So, um, uh, I mean, I have a couple of suggestions on like how we can move forward, but maybe um, uh, Mallory, you'd just like to comment on. Uh, uh, yeah, so, so to, yeah, catch everyone up, um, which you kind of did, but just to restate, um, we've, we've been past last call, but we had a slate of issues in GitHub that you've resolved. There's one, it's not even one of the issues, it's like a sub issue of one of those issues that is just outstanding and apologies, but there's been some list activity during this session as we're sitting. So I'm not expecting everyone to have caught up on that list activity, but Gershbad, if you could just distill for us, because I think this may actually just need to be resolved by the working group, the chairs, the IRTF chair, some combination, maybe the, I guess it's a sort of de facto design team, including you all and Ecker. What is the one outstanding question? Cool. Um, the uh, outstanding issue is on the subsection called content agnosticism uh, in, in the document. And uh, to summarize the sort of considerations and guidelines in the document there, that if your protocol has elements either in the metadata or like in, in plain text available to the network so that they can prioritize or differentiate or discriminate uh, between traffic, then uh, I mean, A, try not to do that. Uh, and B, if you are doing it, uh, sort of uh, include a technical transparency mechanism, but also try to state in your document uh, uh, how you think it can impact um, things like net neutrality and stuff. Uh, I think uh, Ecker's uh, point is that um, how, how do we differentiate between good differentiation versus bad differentiation or prioritization of traffic. I think there are two, three examples, but um, that make me think that some of the uh, issues are just um, technical and or uh, just uh, maybe we can just clarify the document more. Uh, ALPN and port numbers, etc. they used to discriminate between traffic at ends, but like the section is primarily aimed at like what uh, intermediary nodes in the network are doing. Um, uh, yeah, there's a couple, like, uh, I, I, I think the issue is, like, easily resolved by, like, this um, clarification in the text, and we welcome suggestions on that. But, um, yeah, um, some more examples from Hacker are also. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm still not clear. I mean, I know that that's what he said about the good versus the bad, but I think the text had already been changed, and so I'm, I'm still missing what is the final, like, what is the, I, I know he responded, he's not um, satisfied with the, the changed text, even though he wrote his message before he saw the changed text, but do you have an, I'm just trying to get at the nugget and I'm really not, I'm not yeah. understanding what it is. And I don't expect anyone else to either until we can sufficiently explain it. 
Uh, yeah, I, I, I think one misunderstanding is like that all uh, we're sort of trying to comment on all sorts of traffic differentiation. Uh, ALPL or like port numbers, which are only used at the ends, are outside the scope. So I don't think uh, those were valid examples from Ecker, but like things like uh, differentiating traffic like based on IP addresses and stuff. And I think that, sure, like it's, it's an open problem. And uh, if the last uh, talk was any suggestion, it's also something that, uh, you know, the IDF will work sort of against in the future. As well. Okay, so for the narrow case that would be in scope for this document, there's a question of whether or not um, a the guidance is um, sufficient to determine whether or not that um, is di traffic good differentiation is good or bad, right? And, yeah, but, and the, but, yeah, yeah, I, I, I do think that um, uh, I, I mean, it, it's not like where the, the text is saying never do that. Like it's it's also like saying if you are happen to um, if you if you happen to include identifiers that could still allow the network to discriminate, then just like sort of point to the effort you've made in understanding its impact. Yep. Yeah, I think that's the approach as well, that it's not actually a value judgment. It's just, if you're doing it, just explain why. Um, Niels, I see you're in the queue. Anyone else want to comment on this question? Uh, I just want to reiterate, and uh, uh, great to see you all. I just want to reiterate is we really do not try to set standards for what the IETF should be doing but that we're just providing guidelines on how to write human rights considerations in protocol development. So we're not setting guidelines for what the ITF should do. We're that's outside our scope, just providing guidelines for how to write human rights considerations. So that's what we've been trying to do and not changing any way protocols should be written or uh, uh, should work on the internet. Terrific. Perfect. My perfect timing, I think. Well done. Yeah. I mean, so like, look, I understand the instinct to say that, but like, it's just not true. This document is like a number of places it says you should do X. And I just managed to get my email out. And like right in the section you quote, it says, if there's any prioritization, et cetera, et cetera, the protocol should be transparent. So like this document does in fact say that you should do certain things. And even if it didn't, like the, like the reason one writes this consideration sections is to assist in the analysis and guide the design of the protocol. That's why the consideration section exists. And it's the reason this consideration section yeah consideration sections exist. So I just don't think you can say, like this document is like entirely agnostic on what you should do, but it just says, if you do it, you should like write things down. This is not a coherent viewpoint given the way the set setting is. Um, if, if, I could, if I could respond. So yeah, you're right that in some places it's really clear, right? Like violating user privacy, there's some direct value judgment there. But in general, I do, I do think because this is about traffic, um, agnosticism or content agnosticism, it isn't, it isn't always good or bad. You're, I think it's okay to do it sometimes. That's genuinely the response is like, there may be good reasons for it. So I don't know that it is so clear that it's good or bad in this specific case. Sure. Well, I think that, I think that is true, but I think that in order for this document to provide useful guidance, I mean, like, I guess I understand how it's supposed to be used. I'm designing a protocol and I read this document and I would hope this document assist me in designing that protocol. And, and, I, and my point is this text does not do that. But, um, but there isn't a right answer. Uh, okay, but then this text is unhelpful. But that's not the fault of the document. That's because it's complicated. And all we're trying to do is uncover the complication so that that can at least be made apparent, maybe not resolved. Well, but I, I, okay, but I, I guess I don't... I just don't see how it sheds light on the topic, right? I mean, so like, like I've gone back and forth on this topic of AOPN and like, I still don't understand why, I actually I don't understand whether you think AOPN is good or bad. I understand why you think it's good or bad. And it seems to me that like, if we can't answer those questions in any meaningful way for things we've already done, then like this entire section no. seems like not unhelpful. It, so it, if I let me just come in on the AOPN example, I, like as I was clarifying, the, the text of the section is aimed at prioritization or differentiation by intermediary nodes in the network and not the ends. And uh, both of them are primarily used for that, uh, like discrimination at the end. That's not in the scope of the section, but I do agree things like port numbers can be used to differentiate uh, like in the intermediary 
uh, nodes as well. So what do you mean by I, intermediate I, versus the end? I mean, if I'm sending you a signal and like uh, you discriminate where the traffic goes at your end, then it's fine. But like if we're intermediary nodes, like the network essentially. like Is a firewall uh, an intermediary node at the endpoint? I mean, if it's running on the client, I suppose it's- It's yeah. running on the enterprise, it's enterprise firewall. Yeah, sure. That it's an endpoint or oh. intermediary? That, that's, I, I mean, I would consider that an intermediary. Uh, sorry, which one? Intermediary and enterprise. Well, I would too, but AOPN is used for this purpose. In fact, one of the reasons, one of the one of the doc, one of the stated reasons for AOPN is precisely to allow firewalls to term, allow past certain kinds of traffic and, other, and others. Yeah, and, and that's what I said. These things can be used at um, like intermediary nodes as well. Like, and you can differentiate based on port numbers if you're able to see that uh, on your network and. Uh, I, I mean, like the same sort of answer applies to your the your ISP doing like differentiation on speeds, et cetera. Sure, these things do happen. Uh, I think the point is, I to me personally, I'd say like uh, ideally they go away, as I was saying. Like if the last talk inspires uh, any sort of design direction, then these things based on even IP address or port number should not happen in the future. But um, this this section is like not a contemplation of like what uh, like the ITF is doing, right? Like it's a comment on like the consideration of uh, the impact of that decision on humans. So that's how I'd summarize it. I, I I don't have enough knowledge to say like oh can we not use IPv4 at all in the future, right? Like it, it's it's just a um, complicated statement to make, like or contention statement to make in the context of content agnosticism. Okay, I, I guess I just I still don't see how this is this text is useful. It seems to be confusing. It, so, it may not. I mean, we, it, we have made very like certain sections are not conclusive. I, I I agree with you, but like this document is comprehensive because of a consideration of human rights and not comprehensive on like a tree of design decisions, if I may just say that. And if you read the remedy section, it's on similar lines if there's disagreement in the group about uh, what it, all go is good or bad. I just wanna rephrase what you said, Ecker. I think the text is useful. I think it may be unsatisfactory. And that is not something that can always be resolved. And it's, it's an open question potentially, but I'm also hearing that Maybe it isn't so open. Nonetheless, we actually do have to finish. Um, so in terms of um, moving forward on this draft, I see Colin, you're coming to the mic. I'm really glad you're in the queue. Hi, Mallory. Uh, I'm not so sure I'm so glad I'm in the queue, but uh, thank you. Um, Colin Perkins. Um, there's, there's clearly some differences of opinion about this drift. Um, and um, to, to some extent, I think people are talking past each other uh, and people are coming uh, with different expectations for what the draft should be saying and clearly interpreting the text in different ways. Um, and um, you know, we, we have one person saying this is useful and another person saying it isn't. But, and, and I don't think this is because they're, they're trying to disagree. It's because I think they're coming from very different backgrounds and with very different expectations. So um, I, I would just encourage people to, to be aware of those differences and to um, try and spend a bit of time, less time uh, sort of arguing about the specifics and try and uh, perhaps try and find some common ground. And me, I just wanted to say real quick um, that I think that the usefulness of uh, most or a lot of uh, drafts is always debatable. But I think that there is a clear distinction between guidelines and rules. Um, so I think that just having uh, guidelines for how to write or how to perceive human rights considerations is already going to be useful regardless if you can use that, those guidelines as an actual rule that you can apply as you are writing something else. So I just wanted to say that. Thanks, Joey. That's, I think, the spirit in which it's intended. Um, 
Sophia. A quick comment. So as far as I understand, um, the comments that were sent to this draft were very, very late. I don't remember specifically the time, but they were allowed to be late after there was already a consensus about this specific draft in the research group. And I think that we allowed that, and that is fair, but we allowed that in the issue of correctness, if some of the technical definitions were lacking that specific correctness. I think it's great, uh, one of the suggestions that Colin just made of actually trying to find this common consensus between people that come from different backgrounds, but at some point maybe it's good to actually put a deadline to that discussion instead of spamming or spanning it is that the word <laughs> yes spanning it for so long especially because the authors and the community of this research group have already spent the time creating the consensus on this specific document yes i don't know we, colin we, you know <laughs> let me know we, we we do not discard uh comments about correctness of documents just because they came at a later stage of the review process than the research group. So I'm, I'm sorry that the comments came in late, but they seem like reasonable comments and the research group needs to consider them. I think that is very fair, Colin. So I would like maybe to focus the discussion on things that are correctness um, rather than opinions. And yeah, I think considered is beyond what has happened on the list in the last um, several months on GitHub. So um, we have a few people in the queue. Oh, are you? OK. Uh, up, but thank you all. I think we, yeah, go ahead, Gershvad, uh, have the last word. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to say only one issue is left. So we've made significant progress. I don't think it's an issue of correctness. And I don't think even the discussion we had today on content Agnosticism is uh, about correctness, but um, I, I feel like, um, yeah, uh, I, I don't think we have time now, but it will be, um, I, I agree with Sophia, it's great to set a deadline and like also next step. So, yeah, and thanks for everybody who's worked on those issues um, in painstaking detail, including Eric who um, opened them, Niels and Gershvad, Sophia and Colin, you've all been um, in GitHub, um, actively responding, and that we only have, like I said, not even a whole issue. It's like a sub-meta issue of a sub-issue um, left is, is awesome. So we will endeavor to resolve that um, tiny nugget on the list. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate you staying a little bit late as well. Have a good rest of your meeting.